For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 13. Word of God teaches that we ought to be generous on every occasion. And that's what the legacy offering is all about. It's resourcing our church family with the ability to respond to crisis and strategic opportunity with generosity. Friends, we get one shot at this. God's asked us to build his kingdom in Denver. And we have such a brief time here. With our lap around the track, if we're gonna build, let's build to last. I invite you to join together with us on November 23rd and 24th for the Legacy Offering. And let's build in a way that leaves a legacy for the kingdom of God in Denver and to the farthest reaches of planet Earth. Good morning. So I was on a run this morning to, <laughs> after working out and designing a microchip. <laughs> hey, don't hate him because he's beautiful. I'm just saying, it's like, you know, get that girlish figure for nothing. <laughs> Do you have any furniture that your parents gave you? I, we had, I came into the marriage with this heirloom furniture set that my father, who was born in 1940, inherited from his parents. It was made in, in North Carolina, kind of the furniture capital of the world in the early part of the 20th century, I believe, and was built so solidly that we couldn't, we couldn't break it or damage it. It moved with us multiple times. Uh, it fashion eras came and went and came again. And um, when finally we realized we don't have use for the furniture, it was really hard for me to get rid of it because it still worked well. I mean, this dresser that was older than my parents was in better working order than my son's Ikea dresser that was three years old. It, it, and so it was tough to, to get rid of. I mean, I think you could have dropped it out of a second story window and it would have survived. So finally, when we had somebody come take it, it just felt wrong because it, it was legacy furniture. It was like heirloom furniture. And I realized how our generation doesn't have a, a, a value, a language around heirloom items, things that last longer than we do, that are passed down, certainly not furniture. We buy furniture disposably. We use it about as long as it's meant to be used, and then right around the time it is not useful, it falls apart and turns to dust, you know? And what I'm realizing is the difference between that kind of furniture and furniture like I inherited, furniture that stands the test of time, that's built to last. And that's our title for this morning. That's also our theme, of course, for this year's legacy offering. We begin every holiday season at Denver United with the tradition of giving, a free will offering together. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive, starting off the season of consumerism and rat race by, um, by giving together and then decorating the church talking about the Christmas scriptures, culminating in, of course, our biggest outreach of the year on Christmas Eve, such an exciting time of year. I love the legacy offering. I love how you all have responded and what we've been able to do over the years with that. We've enjoyed sharing some of those stories with you in the last several weeks. So that's next week, this morning, as we focus in on that work 
I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as our primary text in verse 10, the Apostle Paul writing. It reads, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. This is a passage less often read because it speaks to something that's a little bit harrowing and unclear. As a, a, a bit of a theological context, we have to look at the reality that Scripture clearly describes that judgment is coming at the end. Do you remember last week as we were wrapping up our series through Matthew 13 and Jesus' rapid-fire sequence of peril, parables likening the coming kingdom of heaven to experiences familiar to his first century hearers. Pastor George did a great job of teaching the last one and described insofar as Jesus said, later it'll be brought on shore, that great catch of fish, and they'll be sorted into buckets. He pointed out how there is a judgment coming. Jesus frequently refers to that, and that that judgment for the, purpose, for the purpose of that parable is not here to be done by us, but then and to be done by them, Jesus, the angels, etc. And so it's there to contrast with what is our work, which is casting a broad net and bringing in a, a vast catch. Judgment is coming in the end. The concept of God's Final judgment is well known if you've been around the church at all. Sometimes a variety of different things are made out of that idea. Scholars frequently refer to that day and that event as the so-called great white throne of judgment or the great white throne judgment, which comes from the most comprehensive passage around this subject. In Revelation chapter 20, the Word of God teaches John sharing us his picture of what is to come. I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. So all are called together and all are called to account. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened including the book of life, and the dead were judged, listen, according to what they had done. Now, book that, bookmark that in your mind because we're going to come back to it. They were judged according to what they had done as it was recorded in the books. There's multiple books. The book that's mentioned specifically and by name is the book of life. What's written in the book of life? Those names who are going to heaven, who are saved from the penalty due us for our sins because of the number of good works they did, the percentage of good works relative to the bad ones, the amount of karma that they experienced, the yin versus the yang. None of those things have anything to do with the contents of the book of life, right? We know this from elsewhere in scripture. The gospel, heart and soul, makes clear we are in that book when we trust in Jesus. When we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, believe in our hearts God raised him from the dead, repent of our sins, make Jesus the Lord of our lives, then what happens in this first portion of judgment on that day is we are judged righteous, or as scholars call it, we are justified, even though we're sinners, and no amount of brokenness and no amount of evil and wickedness and, and sin that's come out of us allows us to stand in the presence of a perfect and perfectly good God. Still, Jesus' righteousness is mapped onto us, right? It displaces our unrighteousness such that at judgment, we're in the book of life and we're justified or judged righteous and granted admittance to heaven with God for eternity based on our trust in Jesus. And that's the gospel and that's the good news. If you've been exploring faith 
coming back to know Jesus, but feeling like, man, I've got so many bad deeds weighing me down. It's going to take me a lifetime of good deeds to, to overcome, to get out of that hole. Hear the good news. You're saved by faith in Jesus because of God's grace, not because of anything you have done or could do, no matter how good your good deeds and how vastly they might or might not outweigh the bad. So the judgment with regard to our eternal destination is somewhat quick and perfunctory. If our names are in the book of life because we are justified by faith in Jesus, we're in. But what Revelation teaches us is that there are multiple books and the dead are judged according to what they had done as it was recorded in the book. So everything we've done has been recorded and we're judged based on that. So what's that judgment lead to? It's not our eternal destiny. It's not admittance into heaven or rejection from heaven and sentence to hell. That's what we normally think of when we think of this judgment at the end of days, right? But there's a second layer, you see, of what happens at that great white throne on that judgment day. The first is justification, righteousness, through Christ and admittance to heaven. But the second has to do not with where we're going, but with what we've done with the time we were here, with how we've built. And today's passage that we're going to dig in on in 1 Corinthians 3 makes clear that this second layer of judgment that's going to happen there in front of God's throne at the end of time has to do with the quality of, of our workmanship during the course of our lives in Christ. The key verse is verse 13. On the judgment day, fire, this is metaphorical fire, will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. I don't think God's going to send a fireball, burn up this building, and if it survives, then I get a reward. I think it has to do more with there's a testing, there's a trial, a shaking out, and God will expose whether we built with quality, whether we built in a way that was going to endure. It'll show if a person's work has any value. And this underscores a key reality of life in Christ that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle or confused with a works gospel and then rejected. We're not talking about salvation here. That is by grace through faith. We're talking about everything else. And what I believe God's word makes clear is that we weren't saved in order to get passage to heaven, primarily. We were saved to get back to building heaven on earth. Right. See, salvation isn't an end. It's a means to an end. Ephesians chapter 2, this is the great evangelical banner that we Orthodox Christians wave that unites us across the spectrum of belief and across the globe and throughout time. It is by what? What? grace that we have been saved through faith and not by our works, lest anyone should boast, lest we should start thinking it's about ourselves. That's the gospel. It goes on to say, though, in verse 10, for this salvation mechanism is true because of or on account of the fact that you are God's masterpiece. You're his workmanship, and you were created to do good works that God prepared well in advance of all this sin disruption and reconciliation work. See, I think sometimes we think that the point of life is to find Jesus and get saved and get other people saved, and that then what we do thereafter is sort of like busy work that your math teacher gives you to do because you finished the test early. Oh, I can't let him go and run around the playground and make noise, so just cut out these things and do that stuff and glue it to that thing, right? They kind of fill in the, the blank space work because, man, they, they, they solved the, the salvation code a little earlier than we thought, so let's give them something to do. What God makes clear is you were prepared as God's masterpiece to do works that fulfill your soul, that put to work the skill and craftsmanship of your hands, the cunning of your mind, the drive in your spirit, that entrepreneurial flame, that never say die, don't quit attitude that people admire about you. All these things were put in you and they were put in you for a purpose and that purpose predates sin and the fall and you're in my needing reconciliation through Christ. And so Jesus came to the earth and died on a cross and brought us back to relationship with God so that we could get back to the work of building the kingdom of heaven on earth for God, which was prepared long in advance for us to do. Do you believe this? 
because it changes the way we think if you do. If judgment isn't just about getting into heaven, maybe it's also about how we build heaven on earth. Verse 14 says, if the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. So it makes clear, look, this layer of judgment, this second function in front of the white throne, it's like you got your parking ticket adjudicated. Now you got the fact that you ran, rolled through a couple of red lights and they caught you on camera. You're there in front of the judge. They're just going to knock out a few things. That's how it's going to work. The first one is rather quick and to the point. Did you trust Jesus? All right, you're in. Yeah, but I want you to know all the good things. It doesn't matter. Jesus is your righteousness. And that, and that alone is why you're justified. Now, let's get on to the second thing about how you build, what you did with the time entrusted to you, with the grace of salvation, once restored to your original factory settings, your creator's good design. What'd you do with it? And it says, this isn't about salvation. The builder, regardless of whether his work will last, even if it's dropped out of a two-story window, like my dresser, or whether it's going to fall apart in year three like the Ikea chairs up in our office. You're going to go to heaven either way, but if the work burns up, you're going to get through by the skin of your teeth, right? If you build in a way that's found at the judgment to last, to endure, there's great reward. And if not, you're going to suffer great loss. The, The loss of that reward, what you will have missed out on, perhaps. We don't know what that is. Are you going to feel sad? Well, there's no tears in heaven. I don't know how that's going to work. But if there's a reward, I want it. I don't even think the reward is the point. The reward is the incentive to align with the point, which is the fulfillment, the finding of my life that comes on the other end of losing it when I submit to God's good design and align with his purposes and receive his truth. The reward or the loss God's word makes clear is based on how we built, the quality of our work. And this, of course, highlights something in us that, uh, or a a variety of things in us that sometimes we like not to see the light of day. You know, it highlights in me the tendency not to build with quality for one or two specific reasons. You know, like, like, uh, I'm going to play the field. I I, I don't want to go all in here because I might miss a good opportunity over there. Or I'm afraid that, that the goods may not be here and I will have wasted my life going fully in this direction. So there's a fear underneath that response, that reticence to do it God's way that is is possible, right? I'm a human. I grew up in a broken human world and had traumas and hardships and, and weaknesses that I didn't address or didn't even know I had until some point in life. It makes sense that there might be a fear. But you know what? Jesus died on a cross, not just so we could be saved and get into heaven, I love how Pastor Neil ministered the sacrament of communion this morning. The blood of Jesus forgives us of our sins and cleanses us of all unrighteousness, right? That has to do with salvation, being in the book of life and going to heaven. But the body of Jesus stands for Jesus being broken for us for what? Our healing, right? Jesus' prayer, his prophecy about himself from the book of Isaiah when he began his ministry, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and to bind up the brokenhearted. See, Jesus came not just so we could get into heaven, but so we could do the work for which we were created on earth whole and well and not encumbered by our own brokenness. He came to heal that fear. See, it's not just healing like my sore back from schlepping furniture around at my folks' house this week, but to heal my heart so that that fear that has driven me from beneath the surface subconsciously that I might miss out so I don't want to go all in here or there because I might miss the real goods. He came to to heal me, to free me of that, right? Or what about this um, idea that maybe um, I'm going to, 
respond to God here if I'm feeling it, or I'll go in that direction when, when that feels right. But then it's, I stop feeling it, or my feelings change, and then I go there. Well, what am I really saying? God's directing me, but really my feelings are directing me, right? And that's possible. We live in human shells that have been acted on by a number of outside forces and that learned and grew as healthy or distorted as they did. But Jesus wants to heal that because my feelings never have been and cannot possibly be a reliable director of God's work. So whether I'm feeling it this month or this year or not, God's leading is still God's leading. But Jesus came not only so that I could go to heaven for eternity, but so that my heart could get healed. So that those things lurking beneath the surface that are steering my ship lose their power and their grip on my life. There's so many of them. Friends, we've got one shot at this. Our lives, they're a vapor. They're the blink of an eye. And then we're gone and we'll spend eternity with God, but we're here now. He's given us this charter to build his kingdom. He's filled us with his spirit to renew us and heal us and empower us. He's placed us in this post-Christian city at this late hour. He's brought us together and formed this oddball church that looks like the city in all its varied grace. And he's asked us to build. And I say, in our lap around the track, if we're going to build, let's build to last. Let's build something that endures beyond its temporary utility for us. It's one thing to build an Ikea chair that sits a few people in our office, and it's another thing to build a piece of furniture that can be an heirloom and represent a legacy. Let's build something that is good for us, but that lasts, that outlasts us. Colossians 3 says, whatever you do, Work at it with all of your heart as though you were working for the Lord. I know some of us find ourselves hesitant to go all in and it makes sense why. It's not without good reason. But the reasons can be good in the sense that they make sense and bad in the sense that they are the reason for which Jesus died. Would you let him in your heart? Would you let him expose the biases, the grips that, the stuff that we've lived through, the challenges we've faced, the obstacles we've overcome have maintained on our hearts? This is um, is what the legacy offering really is all about. It is the merger of community impact and personal transformation. It's where the roads come together of transformation in our community to which Jesus has called us as his church and transformation in our lives to which he has called us as individuals. He loves us enough to take us right where we are and just as we are, but he loves us far too much to leave us there. And so the transformation work that happens as we grow in Jesus' disciples is the building block of the transformational work that happens in a community through a collective growth process. Our vision, as you know, as a church, is uniting across the spectrum to follow Jesus relentlessly and build his kingdom in Denver. And that's what the legacy offering is all about, coming together, uniting a whole that is more impactful than the sum of its parts in order to follow Jesus relentlessly to demonstrate a heart and invite Jesus to grow a life from the inside out that is wholly surrendered, fully aligned with God's creation purpose and redemption intent. And then together from that stance, while growing, to build his kingdom, 
to make an impact that transcends our lifetime, to build in a way that's going to last. So what does it look like to build with quality, to build to last? Well, first, I believe the Word of God makes abundantly clear insofar as we're talking about something like a free will offering, it looks like contributing sacrificially. At the end of the day, this is worship we're doing here. We're giving to God out of the abundance and the blessing that he has given to us. And God's looking at our hearts. I love how Jesus commended and memorialized the poor widow for her two pennies that she gave. You know, that sum didn't move the needle for the temple. Their maintenance needs, paying their priests, trying to give them a a generosity fund to give alms to the poor, it made practically no difference. But Jesus commended her because it was sacrificial. It was all she had, and it demonstrated trust in the Lord. And the point there is, God's not short of cash. He's not looking to get at our money. And I know that some of us, there is a narrative that plays in the back of our minds that makes sense, right, from an earthly perspective. That are like, yeah, it's really a ploy to get at my money. That narrative is always going to be there if you choose it. I would suggest that that comes from some hurt that may well be legitimate, and that Jesus came to heal you and me from. And there's something in our brains that activates when the risk of being hurt again comes about and it says, effectively, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And we put the wall up. But Jesus isn't looking for money because he's short of cash. He's looking at our hearts. And that's where the work of renewal begins. That's the discipleship component. So the building to last means sacrificial giving. And then I believe if we want to build to last, the Word of God asks us to make our worship strategic. Well-intentioned is a good start, but make it strategic. What does that mean? There is a principle of the storehouse that the scripture teaches. It's a metaphor to make the point that when we pool our resources and respond to needs and opportunities, as Pastor Darius talked about, that we get to do each year because of your generous giving through the legacy offering, when we do that, the whole is vastly greater than the sum of the parts. I was an officer in the United States Army to start my career, and In the very beginning at Officer Basic, we learned a series of principles of war, and they apply regardless of the type of warfare. A couple of them were mass and synchronicity. To mass our fire, I I commanded tanks, meant we all shot at the same target. So rather than you shooting here and me shooting there and him shooting over there and her shooting that direction and hoping we divide and conquer, when we all engage the enemy with massed, overwhelming force, the devastation potential is exponential. And the second is synchronicity. We shoot at the same time. Rather than me when I'm ready and him when he's ready and her when she's ready, kind of going like this, when we all shoot at the same target at the same time, the effect is multiplied. And so our enemy is not flesh and blood, but we are fighting against an enemy, an enemy against whom we have superior firepower when we do it heaven's way. And that, I believe, is why God called us not only to worship sacrificially, but to worship strategically, together, as a community, making a vastly greater impact than even the most empowered among us could make individually most of the time. God's point is organizing builders into a church so that collectively we serve notice to this world and to our enemy. Ephesians 3.10 says, God's purpose in all this, salvation by grace through faith, in order to restore us to the masterpiece work we were created for. His purpose in all this was, listen, to use the church, not to use the believer. It's not to use you. It's to use y'all. 
it doesn't roll off the tongue for me like it does for Pastor Daniel. I don't come from anywhere near Texas. I come from the opposite end of the United States galaxy. And so y'all, use guys is how they said it where I grew up. You in the plural, not the singular. To use the church, not the individual believer, but the church, believers growing, healing, redeeming, and responding to God according to his varied grace in us to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Our strategic work shows the enemy in Denver, a deep, diverse, united fighting force that together reflects the greater wisdom of God. And lastly, I'd suggest if we want to build to last, we've got to shift in our thinking. Shift from thinking like a giver to thinking like an investor. What's the difference? Well, it's twofold. First, an investor, to think like someone who is invested is to think like an owner, someone who's bought in someone who has an enduring interest, a long-term stake, right? Imagine um, the two different ways you remodel your kitchen or your bathroom. The one way, if you're planning to live there for the next 20 years, and the other, if you're planning to put it on the market next month, which end of the tile aisle do you go to in Home Depot? depends on how you're thinking. If you're just trying to get it to look nice for showings, it doesn't have to last. But if you're planning to live there, you're going to build it a very different way. Think like an investor, someone who has a personal ownership stake. And then secondly, an investor doesn't give out of admiration. An investor gives out of expectation. An investor doesn't give thinking, well, you know, what that mutual fund manager's doing, that co- those companies he's investing my money in, they're doing really good things for the world. Well, that's well and good, but an investor entrusts his resources expecting a return. Investment contemplates reinvestment. It's looking for a return, increase, and then diversification. Thinking like an investor expects a return. The Word of God teaches, and I love showing you this in 2 Corinthians 9, specifically about a free will offering that Paul was asking the people in the churches in Europe to give for the impoverished and persecuted new Christians back in Jerusalem. He says, now remember this, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. Now, this truth has been distorted and turned into an end unto itself and we've gotten various expressions of prosperity gospel that says, do this and you'll get rich. I don't think that's what it's saying. It says you will be resupplied, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. That's the charter for the legacy offering. That's our charter as Jesus followers, right? And so notice, he who gives bread for food, he who meets our needs according to his glorious riches and enables us to feed ourselves and our family and put a roof over our heads, also is the same one who gives seed to the sower, enables us to go out and not eat everything hand to mouth, but put some in the ground, expecting that it's going to grow and increase a crop that enables us to go and do more. And he will increase your supply and enlarge your capacity. Here's what I, want, what I think this is telling us. God is a good and loving father. He's not going to leave his children begging bread. He will meet our needs. He told us to ask, give us this day our daily bread. But the same God who is a good and loving father 
who brings home the bacon, who provides for his children, is also a savvy businessman. And he's looking for trustworthy, shrewd investors to whom he can entrust his kingdom resources. You're like, well, why does he need to go through me? Why not just come do it himself or send angels? Well, ask him when you get there. But for now, we can either sit around and pontificate on that, or we can accept that he dignified us enough. I love how Pastor Neil said it. What a privilege. He dignified us by allowing us to share in this work. It gives great glory to God to show the enemy that through inferior creatures trusting in him, a superior outcome is going to happen. And so we participate in this work. He's looking for trustworthy investors in whom he can invest, entrust riches for stewardship. And when we hold it loosely, knowing it's his, he wants to give more. See, thinking like an investor expects a return. Jesus said, give and it will be given to you. For all of us who have thrown out the baby with the prosperity gospel bathwater, just close your eyes and listen to the word of God. Your Savior said, give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over into your lap. God's looking for builders. He's looking for builders. It's really hard for me to ask you to give. I just want to be honest with you. There's 51 weeks of sermons I prefer to preach because I feel what you feel which is the weight of spiritual abuse in the past. We don't even pass buckets here in our offering. I don't like creating a pressured environment. However, this isn't primarily about us being able to respond to flood victims in Bangladesh. This is primarily about Jesus being formed in you and in me. And then the overflow of Jesus' formation in you and me is generosity and God's care for people in need in our community, communities in need on the other side of the world and everything in between. That's the way the kingdom works, amen? Can I pray for us? Would you stand with me? Father, in Jesus' name, thanks for your grace and truth. Thanks for your power and redemption in our lives. Thanks for loving us and giving us the the privilege of being a part of your kingdom work. Thank you that what you do in us, you do through us. You make all things new in us and then you make all things new around us through us. We're amazed that we have this treasure in jars of clay on purpose that you would be willing, that you would see fit to work through us while you're working in us. And Lord, that's, that's um, it's not the way we do things, and it kind of blows our minds, but that's part of what makes you amazing. And so um, your truth is our anchor. Would you cause it to shape the way we think and feel and experience this world and the way we respond to you, Lord? And we give ourselves to you for this purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, can we thank God?